you could tell that he was frustrated with life already, and the rain falling was the last thing he wanted in his life at this moment. He begged the lightning to give him a break as he used a plank to cover himself from the rain. But before he knew it, the lightning struck both him and the plank he was using to shield himself. Two men near him saw that he fell and ran to him to ask if he was fine. He breathed his last breath in pain and regret of not being able to do anything but struggle. He realized he couldn't be saved at this point. His mind started to go blank as his eyes began losing their life. He wished he could at least eat salmon one last time. The men bent beside him, but he died. The pain he felt in his lower back made him realize he was in a strange place. The first question he asked was, where is this place? He thought he died, but he is here alive and breathing. He wondered why he was in this place and why he couldn't remember who he was before he came here. He tried composing himself. He told himself to calm down. He remembered his name, age, and what happened before he got here. It was exciting for him to see that he could remember what had happened before he came here. The real worry came to the surface after this excitement. Why was he still alive after being struck by lighting? Or better still, it was a weird feeling that he had the strength he had when he was younger. Well, he already looked so much younger than before. After trying to put everything together, his best assumption was the fact that he had been reborn. Was he really reborn? It looks like he had been given another chance at life. Now, he could finally eat the salmon he craved as he died, but this wasn't the time for salmon. Anyway, the important thing now is trying to find out where he was. He figured it was a labyrinth, and this was when he realized how hungry he was. So hungry he could eat a whole planet. A weird creature came toward him. The thing kept wobbling and jiggling. He tried to understand what it was and touched it. It looked like jelly, but it wasn't jelly. He now understood that this was an entirely different world from the one he came from. He picked up this weird-looking creature. It looked like a giant jelly, or better still, gummy, and decided to take a bite. He could explain the flavor he tasted when he did, at least something to quench his hunger. It had a very soft texture combined with a minty scent. It also did not have any specific taste and felt refreshing to eat, just like water. This gummy monster also had a spicy feeling that made it easy to get additive to it. He was full after devouring the monster. He thought about what the creature was, and as he thought about this, a screen came up with the notification, appraisal result, slime, a slime. He didn't get this at first, and after thinking about this for a long time, he thought that the creature he ate was probably a slime, and also tried to figure out what appraisal meant. As he kept thinking, something beeped just at the side of his head. A screen popped up and brought out his stats. He saw that his name was Shinichi Tanaka. He was 25 years old now, homeless, had no magical attributes, and was a beginner. He has to start from the beginning. The only way this was good for him was the fact that he is now 25 years old. He didn't believe the age at all. He didn't feel like he was younger and wished that there was a mirror nearby so he could confirm if he was really young or he was just being deceived. Was he really reborn as a 25-year-old? But except he left this place, there was no way he could get answers to this question. He stood up and looked for an exit. It was a whole month after he came into this world. In his mind, it felt like a month had passed, but it could have been a year. There was no way he could tell. He fought a wolf and ended up defeating it with the rod in his hand. He got himself some food and decided to look for corpses or something that could give him something at least. In his search for a corpse, he saw a dried up human skeleton with clothes on it. He took the clothes and wore them. He checked the sword on the skeleton and his screen appraised it as a mithril sword. He tried figuring out what mithril was, but that soon escaped his mind as he saw how good the sword was. He had gotten used to living in the labyrinth and had also created a room for himself using a pickaxe that he picked from a corpse to destroy the wall. He figured in his search that this particular area was the safest place in the labyrinth. He entered his makeshift room, and to his disappointment, there was no one to welcome him back. He lit a fire for himself and cooked the wolf meat he got from his hunt earlier. The meat of the wolf was hard and chewy, but there was nothing he could do about it. He had to eat to survive. He checked his status screen again, and he had acquired some new skills, leg strengthening and danger detection, which were both intermediate. He still didn't know a lot of things about this place, but his magic attributes still seemed to be non-existent, and he could use magic because he hadn't seen what it even looked like before. After examining his stat screen, he got hungry again and slept off thinking about food and women. When would he finally be able to leave here? This could be a means to prepare him for life outside this place, really, we can't tell. But his time here would definitely make him tougher than he should be. He woke up and decided to massage his feet. His screen suddenly popped up and he found out that he acquired a new skill. He jumped in excitement as this was the third time he had seen this. The first time was when he got danger detection, the second when he got leg strengthening, and now, he explained that constantly avoiding enemies gave you danger detection. Running wouldn't give you leg strengthening. And because he was massaging his foot, he got a pressure point. 
He commanded that the skill showed him itself as he pressed his food. He felt a sharp pain in his foot. He passed around to stop the pain, and after the pain went away, he noticed that he was more tired than he had been even before he got the new skill. He sat on the floor and wondered if he could use it against his enemy. If he could, it could at least stop their movement for a few seconds, so he could escape then, or better still, run away. It would be hard to win against them with his skill. He had never lost to any of the monsters he had been facing around here, but there were about two monsters he could think of that were at least stronger than he was. The monster was the boss of this area and a humanoid monster. Explaining what the boss looked like when he initially encountered it, he decided to name it Jack, since he was the strongest of the two monsters. He prepared to leave his hideout, but sensed the boss coming and hiding. As it passed him, he saw that it had a scar on its left eye, and decided to leave since the monster didn't notice him. But his leg hit a sword on the floor. He tried so hard to avoid the monster. Let's hope the monster didn't hear the clank of his foot with the sword. The monster did hear him, and as it turned back to attack him, he ran with his legs strengthening. He ran as fast as his legs could carry him. After a while, he got to a safer spot. He wondered how much longer he had to live his life. This place was so complex, almost like a maze, and he was still yet to get to the exit. He saw the entrance to another area in this labyrinth. He entered this area and was shocked as he saw the walls emitting light. He looked around to be sure he wasn't in a place with monsters. He saw a girl on the floor and thought she was a dead body. He admitted she was a beautiful woman, but it was a pity she was dead already. Surprising him, the girl stretched and he saw that she was alive. He yelled at her to get up and told her it was dangerous to sleep in a place like this. He told her his name and asked for hers. She told him her name was Elna. He asked if she was hungry and checked his bag to give her something she could eat. He couldn't understand what she was saying and just did the first thing that came to his mind to do for her. He thought food would have been her first worry and decided to make something for her. She finished the meat he gave her and she decided to help him understand her as she used her staff on him. The magic activated and he was able to understand her. She asked if he could hear her and he was able to understand her words now. This is so surprising though. He realized she could now speak fluent Japanese and wondered what had just happened. She introduced herself to him better now and told him she was Elna, the mage. Mind you, she had also explained that she used translation magic on him so they could both understand each other. She asked him why he was there and wondered if he was here for work. Hearing the word work made him ask her what she meant. He also used this opportunity to ask what this place was. She explained that this was the ninth floor of the Mojito Underground Labyrinth and asked if he was an adventurer. Terrifying, right? What if he had landed on the first floor and in the cause of looking for an exit, he ended up leading himself to the ninth floor? He asked her what the labyrinth was. To his disappointment, she also didn't know what it was. But according to others, it was something related to ancient ruins. She told him they might know better if they went down. The area below was a place no one had entered. He didn't answer all this but asked how he could leave this place. It was high time he left this place already, even if it would just be for a few days. He needed to feel fresh air on his face, really. She replied to him that the only way to reach the top was to go to the stairs located on each floor. Stairs? Easy peasy, right? He told her thank you and hoped to see her again, but she stopped him. He stopped walking and turned to look at her. Her face said something, but he didn't know what, only for her to tell him that she also didn't know how to leave the dungeon they were in. She told him she was a beginner mage, and started ranting about him judging her for being her when she was just a beginner. After ranting for the longest time, she told him she wanted to follow him. He told her he didn't mind that, and she was surprised at how fast he said this. She asked him again to be sure she heard right. He said that he was sure, and that it was better to have company than to walk alone. The real reason for this was well known to him. After noticing for a long time, he asked her why her ears were so long. They were longer than a human's own. She told him she was an elf, and explained that it was a natural trait, they advanced into the dungeon, defeating monsters and looking for the stairs. He kept fighting all the monsters they encountered, and Elna was impressed at how powerful he was. As they moved further, she helped with sensing the monster from afar as he defeated them with his sword. He decided to ask her if she had any offensive power. As they walked, she told him she knew one, but it wasn't as great as he might think. Humble much? She told him that the magic she used was her support magic and showed him. It happened to be as bright as almost blinding his eyes. He quickly told her to cancel it before it got them in trouble, but it was too late. The boss had noticed the light and was heading straight for them. This was where leg strength came in, but Elna couldn't keep up with him and fell with the monster tailing them. He stopped running and ran to her front to fight this monster. He had been trying to evade getting noticed by this monster. All this while only having to face it to save a woman. Elna yelled at him, asking why he wasn't running away. They were facing a real-life monster, and the best thing he could do now was to stop in front of her. 
almost fearless in the face of this huge monster. He told her they hadn't lost yet, and it was only right to save one friend. This surely moved her. He already saw her as a friend after spending little time with her. He told her to support him as he attacked the monster. She used her electric paralyzing attack on the monster, and he used the chance to take out the monster in one strike. But the monster gave him a very strong punch, throwing him into a wall near where they were. His attack wasn't effective, which meant he had to look for something that would be more effective. Elna worried about him and called his name. They were helpless, and there was a limit to what she could do. The monster got a hold of her, holding her by her arms. Shinichi stood up, determined to find a way out of this for the both of them. He tried to see if there was a new skill he could use to help Elna get out of there. He saw acupuncture push and wondered if this skill would work. He decided to use it against the monster. The pressure of this attack heavily affected the monster. In fact, it rendered it immobile for the main time. He noticed that after this, he couldn't use his hand, and this was a huge mess. He needed his hand to fight. He also saw that the effect of the skill he used on the monster would run out before they knew it, and told Elna they had to run since there wasn't any other choice for them. They decided to run away from there. While they did, Elna told Shinichi she was hearing the sound of water beneath them and told him they had to check out. In the process of running, Shinichi apologized for not being able to take her to the suitcase. She told him it was fine and hoped that they would be able to leave here someday. All hope had been lost now, no doubt. They needed at least some hope, no matter how small. She told him they had to quickly go down before the orc that attacked them earlier woke up. They finally got to where the water Elna sensed was. Shinichi drank some and couldn't help but talk out loud about how delicious the water was. He told her the water was surprisingly clear, but it was more like it was glowing. Elna bent down to get a clearer look at the water, and she put her hands inside to get a scoop. Shinichi looked at her weirdly. He did understand what she was doing. She tried using her frame burst power, but nothing happened. She felt this was because she didn't drink much and decided to drink more. Shinichi kept looking at her, and at a point, he started to get worried that she was drinking too much. He told her she was consuming too much, but she didn't listen to him. He decided to pull her out of it. She struggled to get out of his hold and told him if she drank enough, she would be able to become a great sorceress and learn a lot of magic skills. Ma'am, I think you have this wrong. You get skills as you advance in experience. She explained that this water was what they called holy water. It was a mystical liquid. She went further to tell him that this monster helps keep monsters away and also bestows various blessings. This is just the cheat they needed. When Shinichi heard this, he decided to use his appraisal to confirm it. He told her he had a feeling that the water was special, and apparently it could deter monsters, and told her it wouldn't be a bad idea to build a home here. He told her it was time to go, and it was so obvious she didn't want to leave there. He asked if they could get out, as he would like to see outside this place. He asked that they follow the waterways downstream. Elna told him it wouldn't be easy to get that way and pointed at the source of the water, which was a lion statue. He walked toward the lion and told Elna he had a weird feeling about the statue's left eye. As he pressed it, the wall beside them moved sideways, revealing a door. Elna asked how he did this, and she called him amazing. This year in life just wasn't for fun. At least he can survive in every situation he finds himself in. He told her he pushed the lion's left eye. They opened the door and entered. It was just like there was a god nearby that heard their conversations and Elna's heart desires. They saw a neatly furnished and arranged room. It had a bed and chairs to sit on. In fact, anything you needed to live and survive. It even had a mini kitchen. Shinichi entered better, and the first thing he looked for was a mirror. He saw his reflection. To his surprise, he looked younger than he thought he was. This made him understand better what his status meant. This was a huge step for him. He died, but was reincarnated into the same person. Another huge chance at life. He better use this chance to the best of his abilities. He should also make sure not to leave any stone untouched or unturned. Shinichi saw the burner in the room, and it looked so much like something he would see in the world he came from Earth. He found out that instead of using gas or any form of mechanics, they used magic to operate it. He brought out things he stored in his bag to make something to eat. Elna woke up to the smell of the food he was cooking. She walked up to where he was and requested that he give her a bowl. Tasting the food made her regret that she had asked for it in the first place. She told him the food tasted terrible, and he asked if it was salt. She stated that that wasn't the problem, and brought out a small pouch with food seasoning. She made the soup better, and as we see, the soup was the best thing Shinichi had tasted in a long time. He kept asking for more rounds, but after the fourth, she told him they had run out of soup. She offered to make so more, and after they had eaten to their satisfaction, Shinichi ruminated about what their goal was. The most crucial thing on their list was to escape this area they were in. He also thought about what to do about being in a parallel universe. It happened like a movie. He stood up, removed his clothes, and flexed his muscles. He kept doing this, 
waking Elna up. She blamed him for not being able to sleep. She was curious as to what he was doing in front of his mirror. He told her to come see how his body had grown. She told him he didn't have to show her and that he should put clothes on. Shinichi told her that this could have been from the water from the saint pool outside. She told him that the water could have had an effect that reflected the experience gained in a short time on the body. She told him that since he fought the orc, he grew stronger in body size. He told her this wasn't the result he was hoping for, but this didn't look as bad. He decided to try out an appraisal on Elna. She told him that she would like to live here, but worried that someone might have lived here before. Shinichi also told her he wanted to investigate. As they searched, he saw a hidden door behind the bookshelf. Shinichi thought that for them to have found a hidden room in this hidden room meant the person was an extremely careful person. It was also incredible that someone could decide to live in this dangerous dungeon with 20 floors. Whoever created this place took their time to make it to their taste and even built another room in case anything dangerous could happen. They saw a huge bedroom with a toilet and all sorts of things, including books. Elna ran to the bookshelf, took a book, and showed it to Shinichi. She told him it was a book from the great sorceress Moor. She explained who he was to him, and at the end of her story, she told him that the best bet was that Moor owned this house. He collected the book from her and checked through it. He saw a map of the maze they were in, and this was the best thing ever for him. He was as excited as he could be, but Elna was broody. They decided to leave this room to look for an exit. They fought some monster on their way. They stopped for some time, and Shinichi had to ask to be sure if there was really a 21st floor. Elna told him there was. In his head, he knew that if they were careful enough, they might run out of food even before escaping this place. Elna asked where he came from. Of course, she was curious and wanted to know. There was no doubt that she would not have any idea where Earth was. And Shinichi had to tell her he came from a really far place. She told him she was an adventurer and explained that it was a job that people here did to earn money. She urged him to become one too so they could form a party. We all know she had been wanting to propose this to him. She told him if they were in a party together, she would do long-range fighting while he would do the close-up and direct attack. This made sense quite all right. She also told him that she specializes in carrying luggage too, which wasn't bad. They decided to look further into the dungeon. At some point, Elna got hungry and told him she wanted them to get back and rest. Shtat and Nichi Kama, the much more mature and older man here, told her she had to move if she didn't want to eat just salt soup. That is the height of it, eating just water with salt or seasoning. They kept walking and were intrigued by how bright the entrance to the area in front of them was. They decided to enter the area to check it out. And lo and behold, they found a forest. And not just a forest. It was a huge one. They walked into the forest to assess it better, and they saw a tree filled with a weird type of fruit and decided to check it out. Shinichi took one and decided to eat it. Elna yelled that the fruit was dangerous, but he told her it wasn't. Funny enough, she said that because of how careful he was as he ate the fruit. She also plucked on it and decided to eat it. This fruit was one of the best she had ever tasted, as it was sweet and delicious. Shinichi checked the stats of this fruit, and to confirm this, it was indeed edible. Elna told him that it was probably more that planted this tree. Elna enjoyed the fruit, while Shinichi kept looking at his environment for anything new. He saw something weird and decided to check it out. He pulled a grass that he saw and a huge daikon out. Elna was just as surprised as he was when she saw that. He checked the stats and confirmed that this fruit was also very edible. He then decided that the next thing they were going to be doing here was to build a plantation field. They plucked out some more daikon, and at least if that wouldn't last, then for long, it would at least last them a while. Shinichi told her they were going to grow a field of vegetables that only they could eat. He thought about the obstacle they could have and decided that they were going to grow a huge fence around it. Here, he also thought that when they stopped growing, this would be when they would be able to find a way out. After so much thinking, he saw that their biggest problem here could be monsters. He told Elna that they had to check their surroundings for monsters and asked if they could go further into the forest to do that. Lazy Elna told him no, and instead of pleading with her, he told him that he knew that would be difficult for a useless beginner-level sorceress. Insulting here was the best way to get her to agree to this. She asked if he really called her that and told him she would show him the true strength of a first-class beginner-level sorceress and walked forward. They walked further, and saw a large area of dry trees. Elna bent to see something and called Shinichi to come to take a look at the mushrooms she saw. She told him they were extremely high-grade mushrooms and that it was likely they were grown by Moor. The name Moor was so close to her mouth. But thinking about how all these things happened to be here, they really could have been grown by Moor. She even said she would be able to get as many clothes as possible if she sold them. But Shinichi reminded her that they were still unable to get to the surface and dragged her out of this area. In their search, they saw an incredibly large and tall tree. It was alive and was still bearing fruits. In the stats, 
Shinichi saw that this tree fruit can sharpen one of the senses for about an hour, which is very incredible. They both ate the fruit, and after a few seconds, Shinichi got dizzy after he was able to sense his surroundings. Elna was also able to hear things. They then sensed that they were surrounded and were even able to know the number of opponents they had. The monsters showed themselves they were kobold. He told Elna what they were and she told him she knew as she saw them. Elna told him to focus on his attack and added that she would make them flinch for a will. The plan was for him to take them out as she did this. She used her light magic and Shinichi began slaughtering them one by one and finally killed the last one. After he told her, he felt really light, like he could fight more, but he turned back and was confronted by a kobold variant. We have so much hope for him, and he would definitely be able to kill it, no doubt. The monster and Shinichi began fighting. Elna helped a bit with a few attacks here and told him to be careful. He had to be this monster, which was a huge step higher than what he had been fighting before. The monster attacked him with a ball of fire smoke, throwing him off balance. He finds out he is injured, and this registers the fact that this monster can use magic. Elna used her flash magic on the monster and told Shinichi to hurry up as she held his hand and ran. They eventually got to a safe place. Shinichi beat himself up because he let his guard down, and he reprimanded himself for being arrogant and putting so much pride in his strength. Elna asked if he really didn't know monsters could use magic. She told him he took an attack from the monster's firebomb. She commented that it was a huge miracle that he was alive. He thanked her for helping him out of place, but she told him it wasn't a problem. They were friends, after all. It was clear they both had each other backs. They talked for a little bit, and something suddenly struck Elna. She brought out the mushroom and stuck it inside Shinichi's mouth. He was surprisingly healed instantly. She told him she was hoping to use them to buy as many clothes as she liked, but they couldn't leave her yet, so it was better that she put them to good use. They left where they were to another area. Shinichi leaned on the wall as he spoke, but the wall opened, putting him off balance. He fell and, in the process, held Elan's hand. They fell together. They rolled off into another area, and they both stood up to look at where they found themselves. But to their surprise, they saw a lot of dead bodies. Shinichi went closer to observe the bodies and found out they had even decomposed. What could this mean and what exactly was going on? Another dead body dropped from above. Ellen told him she had heard of something like this before, but it was weird seeing it happen right in her face. She even said that she couldn't believe the dungeon was gathering the bodies itself. Shinichi couldn't believe his ears. He asked if she was really sure, but she told him she was certain the monster couldn't be doing this, and it seemed really convenient for the dungeon. Shinichi began looking through the dead bodies. Elna told him this was shameful and urged him to stop. He told her they were just borrowing some of their things. There were a lot of things they didn't have, so it was only right that they picked up a few things from there. She agreed and joined him. They found so many things as they looked through the dead bodies. When it was time for them to leave, they said a few words of prayers to pay respect to the dead. Elna told him she was hungry and urged that they head home. Hearing the word home shifted something in him. He had been homeless for a very long time, but now had a place he could at least call home. Shinichi remembered a little part of his life when he was on Earth. In this particular memory, he was with his son and wife. His son calls him his first name no matter how many times he tells him to stop. This particular day, he is traveling to meet his mother and father. They left, and that was the last he saw of them. They got involved in an accident and unfortunately died in the crash. This must have been tough for him to handle. He woke up to the thought of how he lost the two people he valued the most in his life. He stood up and decided to clear his head by building a fence like he told Elna. When he finished this, he looked at what he had just done and was very proud of himself. Elna ran towards him as some chicken monsters chased her. Shinichi fought them off and killed some. They are called rabbit chickens, and their meat would surely be delicious. She thanked Shinchi for helping her and explained how she got into that situation. They decided to head home to eat, of course. Elna cooked, and her food was so good that Shinichi told her she could have been a cook instead of a sorceress. He asked why she ended up choosing a dangerous job like this one. She told him why she decided to become an adventurer and spoke about it for a little bit, before they headed back to the place where they found a corpse to scavenge again. He found a dagger. He looked around again and saw a cloth hanging on the wall. He asked Elna to use her magic to help bring the clothes, but it seemed her magic was getting nullified as she hit the coat. Shinichi began throwing things at it to bring it down. Elna wondered why he seemed so interested in it. After so many trials, he was able to bring it down. His determination helped to an extent. The coat came down, but he noticed he couldn't appraise it, but wore it despite, and it fit it perfectly. Aelin told him this mantle he had on could be a magic tool. She further explained that it was a magic tool that sorcerers created to help them store things. They got back home, and Elna tried to cast flame magic on Shinichi, but he didn't work. She was devastated that she still hadn't been able to use intermediate magic. 
Shinichi asked if she really tried to cast a spell on him. She was probably just trying to test the strength of the mantle he had on, but she had no hard feelings. They talked for a little while again before Shinichi brought up the idea of heading back into the forest. Elna told him she didn't mind, but she didn't want to be attacked again by the kobold Varaint they had seen before. Shinichi told her not to worry, as he had a new skill she could use and he had also gotten stronger. He told her he had a feeling they wouldn't lose anymore. She asked about the secret weapon he was talking about, but he didn't answer her. He told her the next thing they would be looking for was the temple-looking area near the forest. They were really ready to explore every bit of this dungeon. Two heads are really better than just one. He showed her the weapon he made and even explained how he made it. She might not have understood his explanation, but this shows how really smart he was. She praised him for being able to make a magic item in such a short time. He told her to stay alert here. They were entering the kobold's territory, and they needed to be careful. As they looked through, Elna saw some mushrooms, but the strange thing about this was that there was a red one, just right in the middle of the other white ones. He took it and decided to eat it. Elna picked more, and Shinchi suggested that they make mushroom soup when they got back home. Elna asked that they look for herbs, and they saw some useful herbs. Shinichi even explained how to cook some to her. When she told him he was giving her too many details about a plant, he said he grew up with grandparents who lived in the mountains. They decided to leave this place, and as they kept walking, Elna stopped and told Shinichi that she was hearing the sound of a child crying and the voices of kobolds. This is dangerous, but they would definitely go to save the child. They got there and saw a child on the tree, as some kobold attempted to climb the tree to get to him. They fought off the monster, but it gave them difficulties. The animal appeared to be a bit smart, really. It was evading, dodging, and fending off Shinichi's attack as they fought. Shinichi brought out one of his secret weapons to fight the monster, and Elna was disappointed. The monster cut off the ropes of the weapon he used, and as this happened, he told Elna to use her lightning magic on the monster. He then used another secret weapon with his acupuncture push. With this, they were able to injure the monster, but it attacked him with the fire smoke ball it had used before. The attack didn't work, and before he could even decide to wonder why this happened, he decided to use this next attack to end the monster. He sat by the monster's corpse as he thought about the monster's magic not hurting him. Elna, on the other hand, was trying to help the boy they saw. She gave him a mushroom, and Shinichi walked toward them and tried using his appraisal on him. He found out this boy was a holy beast and was actually born to a cobalt. How did this happen? Anyway, he was abandoned and has been roaming around since then. Would they turn him on his way back to roaming or take him back to their home with them? It turned out Elna knew a bit about the holy beast. She told him they could be allies with humans and were similar to gods in some countries. Shinichi looked at this boy again, and he reminded him of his son. Shinichi then did something. He told the boy they were just there to save him and told Elna they had to leave. They left to look for mushrooms and saw so many types, including poisonous ones. Shinichi asked about Elna's kingdom, Rogas. They left where they were and walked out of the forest. As they did, Elna told Shinichi she was curious as to where he came from, but in his mind, he knew that if he told her how he got to be there, she might not understand. But there could be a huge twist where she could have also been reincarnated. He was just trying to be careful anyway. After a while, Elna told him they were almost at the temple. She kept looking at the map as she walked. Unknowing her, a kobold was trying to attack her, but as it jumped out, the boy from earlier attacked and killed it in one strike. The boy collapsed after helping them with the monster. Shinichi ran to where she was and gave him food to eat. They had to take him with them. Elna asked what they were going to do with him. Shinichi's answer to this was that even though he was worried about their food supply, the boy seemed valuable, provided he had been fed and catered for. It has been decided they were going to take him with them. The boy slept off in Elna's arms. She asked what name they should call him. Shinichi told her to do that since she was the one who wanted to bring him with them. But before she could even come up with a name, he decided to name the boy Pero. They got to the temple they had been looking for. Elna told him she had seen somewhere like this before but couldn't remember where. Shinichi checked the surroundings. He saw a stone and went to touch it and saw a menu on it. The notification welcomed him to the temple but told him he didn't have a transfer address so he couldn't transfer. He told Elna what he saw and that was where it clicked that she had seen this same temple at the entrance of the maze. Shinichi asked if there was a place like this on the surface. She told him yes and said she didn't know why someone made it but it had been there for the longest time. She touched the stone and it told her the same time. It also said she should obtain transfer points. She wondered what this meant. They tried figuring it out, and Shinichi pointed out that it seemed like the system was asleep before, but it seemed to be functioning now. He told her that since they didn't have any transfer points, they had to get to the surface with their effort. Elna stated that it would be tough with their food supply, and since they had a map, it was impossible to get lost. 
She told him they had to get enough food that would last them till that they were able to find the exit out of this place. They had to leave here. It had been too long. When they got back to their home, Elna cooked. The boy was still sound asleep. It looked like he hadn't even had a chance to sleep well. Being in the forest alone must have been so scary for him. They went to look at him as he slept and found out he had eaten the poisonous mushroom Shinichi had eaten earlier. He asked what they could do about this, but Elna told him to leave this to her. She used her poison removal spell to remove the poison affecting him. It came out in a small black ball. Shinichi took the ball and looked at it. He then decided to ask if the position was a slow-acting poison, but she told him no. This helped clear his doubts about the red mushroom he ate. It was something different from what the boy ate. When the boy woke up, Elna served the three of them. The boy had difficulty eating the food, but Shinichi showed him how. Elna told him to try teaching the boy some words, but he told her that she was well-suited to do it. She agreed, but only if he would get her new clothes when they got to the surface. She held Pero's hands in anticipation that she would start teaching him. She realized they had completely forgotten about clothes for him and asked Shinichi what to do. He told her all the clothes they found in the disposal area were for adults, but she said she would make something for the boy out of the clothes they found. They got clothes and shoes for him and he loved them. A few days later, the boy was able to talk and even help Shinichi in the field with their plants. He commended the boy's growth. Elna came in holding a rabbit chicken. It was so obvious she had also grown a lot. She had become braver now. Elna was a scary cat before. Things have really changed. What she caught wasn't going to be enough food for the three of them, so Shinichi offered to hunt next time. In his hunt, he saw a tiger bison and defeated it. Before it even saw him, he brought it back to them. Perot was happy seeing how huge this animal was. Shinichi then began cutting the meat as Perot watched. Elna wanted to watch too, but the smell that she perceived as she bent to look took her back. They needed a bath. After they did, they dressed up and decided to head back outside to head to the surface. They left the room and walked towards the 19th floor. Wow! They were on the last floor, and this wasn't going to be easy. As they walked, they noticed it was too quiet. Pero sensed something coming towards them and told Shinichi. Pero told them to leave the animals to him and was able to defeat the wolves. Shinichi commented that he had the power of 100 men and asked if they were on the track as they decided to continue their journey. But before they could continue their journey, the orc boss approached them. This time, Shinichi was able to defeat it, and they continued their journey after this. He has gotten really strong now. This is very impressive. Hotten, he bent down to cut the orc's meat, but Elna stopped him, told him it wasn't right to eat human-like monsters, and reminded him of the kobold variant they saw. He told her he didn't make any attempt to eat it because he loved dogs. The orc, however, was another case entirely. A screen popped up reporting that he had acquired a new skill. He saw the skill and asked Elna if she knew what the skill was about. She didn't know what it was either. He tried using it out, but he couldn't. They decided to leave there. And as they did, Elna saw a treasure box. She fantasized about it, but it ended up being a monster and eventually needed Shinichi's help after sneaking the so-called treasure she was expecting into the box. The monster grabbed her leg. They helped her out of this. Shinichi stabbed the box in the back. This made it release her legs. Kind-hearted Pero gave her mushrooms to eat. Elna told him to try using the skill he got earlier on this monster, and it worked. He found out that he could use the skill only on dead things. This skill would help him obtain skills from dead things. She called him a cheater, but he asked that they keep the secret between them. He went to the box, picked it up, and began searching its insides. Elna asked what he was doing, and he told her he was looking for the heart and liver. She was disgusted. There was really nothing this man couldn't eat. No meat is allowed to go to waste. He cooked it and offered her some. She collected it, ate it, and agreed that it was good. Shinichi, Elna, and Pero were on the 19th floor. Shinichi was astounded by how useful the scout skill he learned from the Mimic was. The three were astounded to see a massive ice centipede. They decided to kill it, but the massive centipede proved difficult to defeat. After a fierce attack, they were able to defeat the centipede. Elna then inquired about the Taranaki fire, which Shinichi mentioned during the fight with the centipede. He told her it was his special move before telling her to stop, explaining that his head hurt. Shinichi then picked up the skill from the dead centipede, and a guy and two ladies observed them, discussing how the trio, Shinichi, Elna, and Pero, defeated the powerful creature and how Shinichi was extremely skilled. One informed the others that they had forgotten to thank Shinichi and his friends. They approached Shinichi and his friends and introduced themselves to them. The guy introduced himself as Mikey, the Larissa's leader, he referred to the lady with long hair as Annie and the one with short hair as Coco. He told them that they appeared to have irritated the monster and were unable to defeat it for various reasons. He explained that his sword snapped 
Annie's magic was ineffective because its attribute was inappropriate for the job, and Coco could not fight because she was not good with bugs. He thanked them for being there, and Annie reminded him that now was not the time to laugh. She informed him that his sword was broken, and there was no way they could make it in such a state. Shinichi asked if they could go together, explaining that there should be no problems because they were going to the same location. Mikey thanked him, and Shinichi asked Elna why she was hiding. Annie informed Elna that they were aware of her presence. Elna emerged from her hiding place, and Mikey was relieved to see her, telling her that, despite her appearance, she appeared to be still alive. Elna yelled at him, attacking him, and questioning who he called trash. Annie then questioned Elna's decision not to tell her about the job she had taken. Elna responded that it was because she thought the rewards were good and there wasn't much danger. She then asked if it was bad. Annie informed her that it was bad because she had gone missing for a month. Annie drew Elna into her embrace, telling her she was relieved she was okay and explaining how worried she was about her. Elna addressed Annie as her older sister. Shinichi wondered if the two were sisters, as he couldn't imagine them being blood relatives. He wondered about their relationship, and the two sisters couldn't stop talking. Elna told Annie that they were also investigating the Dawn Rat, and they wanted to confirm if there were any survivors. After waking Mikey up, Pero and Shinichi ate the ice centipede, saying how good and tasty it was, and then they all left the place. They all got to the fifth floor, and Elna was surprised to see a bug on her breast. Shinichi asked her what was wrong, and she showed him the bug on her breast. Shinichi looked at her breast and asked if she meant that little guy. She hit him, yelling at him for getting too close and calling him stupid. Shinichi stated that she was a savage, and he then recognized the threat of the Solidarity Spider, a large poisonous spider that lives in groups. He told everyone to prepare, explaining that many of the spider's friends were approaching them. Annie used her needle rain magic to kill the spider, while Shinichi used his ice breath to fight. Annie told him they both had great compatibility and asked him if they could party. He replied that it didn't sound bad, and Elna told them no. Annie told her she was joking and didn't mean to steal her little sister's friend. Elna told her obviously, and then moved closer to Shinichi, telling Annie she would never hand over Shinichi. Shinichi tried to use that opportunity to take some of the spider skills, which were web generation and creation, and then playfully used the skill on Pero. Pero found him amazing, and Elna told him to stop playing around and told him they should leave. They all got to the 10th floor, and Shinichi thought it had been days since they left the hidden house. He checked his stats and thought again that he had considerably expanded his skills, thanks to the skill pickup. He told others that they should head for the stairs, and they went through the 10th floor to the 9th floor and continued going. Once they reached the 5th floor, they started seeing several people. They went through the 4th floor, 3rd floor, and 2nd floor, and then they finally reached the 1st floor. They finally found the exit and were out of the maze. Pero was amazed at how the outside was so spacious, and then Shinichi walked a bit far from others, admiring the surface of that world. Shinichi informed them that they had finally made it out of the maze, and Mikey stated that it appeared that this was where they would part ways. Annie told Shinichi they needed to return quickly to report to their guild. She told him about the closest town to where they were, Marna, and that they should go to the guild there if they wanted to form a party. Shinichi informed her that they would go to that town, Shinichi and Mikey exchanged a handshake before Shinichi told him it had been fun traveling together. He told him they should meet again someday, and watched as they left. As they walked to continue their journey, Elna yelled out Shinichi's name, telling him she knew it and where it was. Shinichi asked what he meant, and she pointed out the transportation temple, which was also on the 21st floor. Shinichi responded that it most likely referred to the temple near the miniature garden, which they could return to at any time. Elna asked Shinichi if he planned to return to the hidden house. He replied that he was returning once he had enjoyed his fill of the surface. She yelled at him, saying she couldn't believe him and that he should live in the town. She asked him why he came to the surface, and he replied that when he first got there, he thought he wanted to escape the maze as quickly as possible. But that hidden house had nobody around, plenty of necessities stocked, and it was comfortable. He explained further that the house was difficult to abandon in a world where he didn't know if the social security system existed. He then asked Elna that they should slowly enjoy the surface at that moment. Pero was so happy and amazed at how spacious it was as they walked around. Then Shinichi asked him if it felt great and explained that it was completely different from the room where they had the miniature. Shinichi then said that they had been walking for about two hours at that moment and then asked where the Marna town Annie told him about was. Elna told him that he would see the town very soon, 
and then they finally arrived at the town. As they walked through the town, Shinichi said that he was surprised that there was a town not too far from the giant maze, and Elna replied that the town was sometimes called an adventurer town, since it was so close to the Mahedo giant maze. They saw a pig, and then Elna explained that it was a Mohican pig and livestock commonly eaten around that area. Shinichi said that, as he had expected from the parallel world, and judging from the livestock, the parallel world was slightly different. They continued looking around, and Shinichi asked them if they shouldn't head to the guild. They arrived at the guild and looked around, seeing many adventurers there. Elna replied to him that they were going to become one of them. Shinichi asked himself if a homeless person like him would be an adventurer. He thought he was keeping his promise to Elna, but that was the job for him, since it was an occupation one could do independently. The receptionist gave them an application for the adventurer registration to fill out. Elna asked Shinichi what they should name their party. She told him it was some hassle, but he should try to think of one. She then thought of one, telling Shinichi that maybe they should go with something like Thunder Dragon Claw or Fire Dragon Eyes. Then Shinichi told her that their party name would be Homeless. Elna told him that was stupid, and then asked him why he would name their party like that. He told her it was her fault for leaving it up to him to decide the name. The receptionist told them their registration was completed and gave them their adventurer cards. She explained to them that everyone started as a beginner rank adventurer, and depending on their abilities, they could advance towards the immediate, advanced, special, and master ranks. She wished them good luck after explaining to them again that their rewards would increase as their ranks progressed. Shinichi thanked the receptionist, and then, as they walked, Elna happily announced to both Shinichi and Pero that they were officially a party at that moment and also told them that they should take a bunch of missions and make a ton of money. Shinichi agreed with her, and as they were out of the guild, they saw a man announcing to other people that the town was in panic. He told them that the Factus dragon had appeared. Shinichi asked him what the creature was, and he replied that it was a large, lizard-like monster. Then explained that since a long time ago, the monster would occasionally show up around that area, and when it appeared about 20 years ago, it had 200 victims. Shinichi and his party met Mikey and his group again, and then Shinichi told them they met again. Mikey asked Shinichi if they knew about the Factus dragon yet, and he said yes. Mikey then told him that was perfect, and that he didn't have to explain everything. Mikey moved closer to Shinichi and then apologized, telling him that he would like to ask him to help them take down the lizard monster. Shinichi asked him if he wanted them to help. Shinichi explained to Mikey and Annie that they had just become an adventurer, and Elna told them the name of their party, which was Homeless. Mikey told them the truth, explaining that Marna lacked fighting power then, and it was just their luck. All the adventurers who stood a chance of fighting the monster were out of town. He explained further that it would all be over if the monster got into the town. Mikey continued talking to Shinichi, explaining that he was impressed when he witnessed him defeating the centipede from before. He then asked if it would be possible for him to lend them a hand. Shinichi was silent, and then Elna asked him what was troubling him. Annie was against having Erna join the fight, and then Erna asked her why. Annie explained to her that ever since she was little, up until that moment, she had only been able to use beginner-level magic, and she didn't think she stood a chance of fighting that monster. Erna told Annie she was wrong and explained that her magic had improved since a long time ago and her time in the maze had made her stronger. Annie yelled at her, asking her if she had any idea how worried she was. Erna charged towards Annie angrily and then yelled at her, telling her she didn't care about her and had always looked down on her. She told her again that she would become a great sorcerer someday and would show her. Annie told her she was still clinging to that delusion of grandeur and then yelled at her that it was time for her to look at reality. Erna cried out, telling Annie she didn't understand her feelings. Shinichi pulled Erna away from her sister and told her to take it easy. He said they would help Mikey and his group remove the monster and explained that he had promised to keep Erna out of danger. He proposed that in exchange for helping Mikey and his group, the homeless would receive all the rewards before it was split. He went to kill the monster with his party. The next scene shows the guild receptionist announcing the elimination target to all adventurers and the awards to be given to the party that defeats the monster. She also explained that all those who assisted in fighting would be awarded appropriately, and she also pleaded with them to all participate. Shinichi told Pero and Erna that the guild was stirring up their spirits and explained that if he thought they were in danger, they would withdraw immediately. He told them not to think about doing anything like throwing their lives away. 
they started fighting with the lizard monster, but could not defeat it. They fought ferociously with the monster and were able to save Pero from the monster. They were able to save Pero using their magic, and Erna continued attacking the monster, but ended up making it mad. She was also injured during the fight, and Shinichi told her to cast her electric paralyze instead of attacking the monster with convergence balls. He then noticed some yellow spots on Erna's body and asked her what they were. Shinichi told her that the spots were glowing and some were going away. He looked at the spots and discovered it was a healing acupoint. Shinichi wondered what the healing acupoint was. He thought that if he assumed that the appraisal results were correct, Erna might have incredible magic abilities, but she was afflicted with sickness. Because of that, she couldn't manifest her natural powers. He then decided to remove the spot with an acupuncture push, and then he asked Erna to listen to him and explain his thoughts to her. Erna asked him if he was talking about the thing that makes someone immobile, and also she asked him why he thought that would work. He replied that he had heard about it and explained that it had a healing effect. Erna asked him if he was saying that her magic power had been weak because of some sickness or something. The monster stood against them again, and then Shinichi asked Erna what she wanted to do about it. Erna looked determined and told Shinichi that was their only chance to defeat the monster. He apologized to Pero and pleaded with him to look the other way for a little bit. Pero did as he was told, and then Shinichi treated Erna's wound. Erna yelled out in pain, and when Shinichi was done treating her wound, they found Pero attacking the monster himself. Shinichi told Erna they should hurry up and help Pero as the situation wasn't good. He asked Erna if she could move, and she could do so, telling him that she had never felt that much power before, and at that moment, she should be able to pull off that spell. Shinichi told her the monster was approaching them and asked if she could defeat it. Erna asked him to return and then used her magic on the monster. Erna remembered how her father insulted her. He told her that she should have learned intermediate magic by then and then yelled at her for being an embarrassment to the Fredria family. She apologized to her father and sister. Annie comforted her by telling her it would be okay. She told her that she had magic powers and could use them someday. Back to the present. She confronted the monster and then was able to defeat it. Shinichi moved closer to the monster and saw that it wasn't moving. Then, he asked Erna if she had truly killed it. He then made a final stab just to be safe, but the monster stood up again. Erna attacked the monster with the flame wall magic, and then she explained to Shinichi that the magic was an intermediate magic spell called a flame wall. She explained further that it absorbed fire attacks and that the spell had a lot of vitality. The monster then tried to run away, and Shinichi told Erna they needed to stop it. He asked her if she had any magic that could stop its movement. Erna chained the monster with a flame chain since the electric paralyze didn't work. Shinichi landed the fishing blow on the monster, but the monster broke free from the chain and then Mikey and his party approached them. Mikey asked if it wasn't too late to get in on the reward and then told them that he could only buy them a small bit of time. Annie asked Erna if she could fire the magic again, and Erna replied that she could, but it might be tough to cast one of those forces again. Annie told her that she was the only one who could fire magic powerful enough to defeat the dragon, and that she would give Erna her magic power, and she would be able to cast her strongest magic one more time. Annie couldn't believe that Erna had grown that much. She gave Erna her magic power and told her she could do that. Erna was overflowing with magical powers and then thought that Annie should watch what the great sorceress, Erna Fredria, looked like. She attacked the monster with a maximum level of flame burst. Everyone watched in awe at the amount of force Erna used against the creature, and Annie thought to herself that the force surpassed even the best of the best. Erna became weak after using that much force against the creature, and then Annie ran to meet her, asking if she was okay. Erna replied that she was okay, and explained that she only used too much magic power. Then she asked about the dragon, explaining to Annie that the creature had a ton of vitality, but was no longer moving. Annie told her that she defeated the Factus Dragon, and she felt relieved after hearing that. Pero and Shinichi approached Erna and were relieved when they saw she was fine. Pero hugged Erna, addressing her as Big Sis and telling her how amazing she was. Mikey then addressed them as a homeless bunch and told them that they were something else. He said he thought there was something off about them many times, but they always proved him wrong. Shinichi patted Erna's head, claiming they had won because of her. He pulled her up and asked if they should go back to town. Erna agreed and told Pero and Shinichi that they could now refer to her as the great sorceress Erna-sama. Shinichi expressed concern that she was becoming overconfident. Pero expressed his hunger and Shinichi suggested that they eat when they got home. 
The next scene showed Erna holding a small pouch and then going to Shinichi's room to ask if he was awake. Shinichi told her she had been nosy that morning and should be quieter when entering rooms. She showed Pero and Shinichi the awesome skills she had picked up from the Factus Dragon. Shinichi told her that she was becoming superhuman too quickly. She told him to forget about that, and then explained that she had got their reward for defeating the dragon, which was 30 gold coins, and then told them they should go shopping. Shinichi asked her if there was something she was looking to buy in particular. She mentioned clothes, shoes, and makeup, and before she could complete her statements, Shinichi told her that he got it and then asked if an adventurer truly needed makeup. She told him yes, and then explained that it was a necessary expense for a beautiful sorceress. Shinichi was inattentive, and then she twisted his face, telling him to look at her face when he was talking to her. Shinichi told her that he got what he was saying and that she was going to break his neck. They finally went shopping, and while Pero and Erna shopped for clothes and other things, Shinichi saw some condiments and couldn't believe that they had found such a thing in that world. He was happy that he could probably eat some Japanese food with soy sauce and miso. Erna asked him how long he would keep the smile on his face, telling him it was weird. She told him they had to get some spare clothes for Pero, which made him so happy. Erna asked Shinichi if he could watch over their stuff, and as Shinichi watched over their stuff, an armored lady and a guy were seen arguing if Shinichi and his party were adventurers or knights. The lady asked the guy if he knew Novin had come to that town. The guy replied that if the witnesses were right, he had to be somewhere around there. He told the lady it would be tough to search for him in such a spacious area. The lady then condescendingly approached Shinichi, telling him she had a question for him. Shinichi stared at the armored lady standing before him and thought to himself that she was a beautiful but condescending lady. He asked her what was up with her, coming out of the blue. The lady looked so angry, telling him what was wrong with his attitude, explaining that she was a knight, and then asking how he dared to stay seated while talking to her. She pointed her spear at him, asking for his name, and also threatened to stab him at that moment. Shinichi introduced himself to her, and then she yelled at him, asking him if he was trying to make a fool of her. The guy the lady was with addressed her as Freya and tried calming her down. He apologized to Shinichi for bothering him and told him they were trying to contact him because they had a few questions to ask. He asked Shinichi if that was right by him, and then Shinichi replied that he would answer what he could. The guy thanked him and then asked if he had heard of a man named Novin. Shinichi told him no, and then Freya told him it was useless trying to lie. She told him that she saw him acting strange just a moment ago and that he must have been frightened because he was trying to hide something he was guilty of. Shinichi told her he was looking at her chest, explaining that even though she had armor to cover it, they were rather plump, so he stared at it several times. Freya yelled at him, calling him a pervert, and then asked him if he was trying to evade the question. Shinichi replied to her that he didn't know Novin's location, but he wouldn't mind if she could try to torture him to get that information. The guy Freya was with told her to hold on, explaining that he understood what Shinichi was saying as a fellow man, and then apologized to her on Shinichi's behalf. Freya addressed him as Gail Dono, and then Shinichi told Dono he didn't know the guy they were looking for. He apologized for being unable to help, and Dono thanked him for his time. Shinichi apologized to Pero and Erna for keeping them waiting, and then Erna asked him if Dono and Freya were acquaintances. He replied that they only asked him some questions and then asked if they were done shopping. She told him they were just about to do so, and then he asked if they needed to head home, but Erna told him that she wanted to go and eat some delicious food. Shinichi told her he didn't know if it was fatigue from the previous fight, but he was feeling sleepy. His stats asked him if he would evolve, and everyone heard what he said. They all congratulated him and watched as he wanted to do so. He told Erna that he didn't understand what was happening, and then asked her to explain. Erna explained what evolution means, and then promised to stay by his side, no matter what he became. She also told him it would be a waste if he let the chance slip away. Shinichi decided to evolve, accepted the evolution, and returned to the inn. Shinichi woke up with a dry throat and then went to drink water. He couldn't quench his thirst, and then he wondered why he was so thirsty at that moment. He reflected that all he had been doing was sleeping, and wondered if this was a side effect of evolving. He looked at his reflection and was so surprised to see how much he had changed. He asked himself what was in his reflection and asked himself again if it was a monster. He wondered if it was his evolution. There was a red eye on his forehead, and he thought that he felt filled with power, a wider field of vision, and improved eyesight. 
He was impressed at how amazing his evolution was and was so excited that his body couldn't stop moving. He started moving around and then came across some guys threatening a lady. Shinichi was determined to use that moment as the perfect chance to try out his powers. He apologized to the guys for intruding and then told them they would all be his guinea pigs. The guys all wondered if he was a monster seeing his third red eye, and then they attacked him with knives, but none affected Shinichi. They found that to be impossible and decided to flee, but before they could escape, he attacked them, and the lady he rescued fainted after seeing what happened. He told the lady that it was dangerous for a lady to walk alone at night, and then he left the place. The next scene shows Shinichi sharing his experience the previous night with Pero and Erna. Pero told him he liked his evolution and would also love to evolve. Erna then told them that she thought that it was time for them to return to the hidden house, and then Mikey and his party were seen approaching them. Mikey showed them a poster with Shinichi's face, explaining that there was a wanted poster saying that a pervert had shown up in town the previous day. Shinichi told them it was a misunderstanding, explaining that he only helped a girl. He then told Erna and Pero that they would hide out at the hidden house for a while. Erna apologized to Annie, telling her she would return later, and then ran after Shinichi. Shinichi and his party had returned to the hidden house, and everything had settled. They were seen talking, and then Erna told Shinichi she did not want to do any farm work. Shinichi told her he just wanted to ensure they had enough food for a stable lifestyle, and Erna asked why they couldn't just get the supplies from the town. He told her no, and she asked him why. Erna insisted she didn't want to start a farm. They continued to discuss how to build a farm, and Shinichi told Erna that if she hated it so much, she didn't have to help him with the construction, and that Pero would. He then asked her if she could help plan the miniature's interior. She told him she hated how he had asked that, and then they started. Five hours later, Erna was tired, and Pero was hungry. Shinichi explained to them that he knew the operation would take some time, and it would have been better if they had a little more assistance. Just then, a group of tigers and bisons approached them, and he defeated them. He picked up the tiger bison, boss skill, and then explained to Erna that he had picked up a skill called the guardian skills. Erna explained to him that the skill was incredibly rare and that he could control monsters and people with it. After talking, he told her they should return to creating the farm. They created the foundation, and Erna asked him if they should head to Marna Town to look for cows. She asked him again if they were going to the town. She told him that since they had run out of season and condiments, they should go shopping, and they could also get makeup. After a few weeks, Shinichi and his party returned to Marna Town to exchange weapons they picked up on the run for money. Pero was interested in the weapon, explaining to Shinichi that he thought he would be stronger if he had a weapon. Pero had been worried about being useful since they fought against the lizard monster. Shinichi gave Pero one of the weapons, and Pero thanked him. Then they went looking for cows, were shown various types of cows, and were asked to choose one. They asked the owner for the prices of the cows, and he gave them the prices while also explaining the nature of each cow. The man told them that he believed they were adventurers based on what he saw. He asked if everything was fine at the guild, and Shinichi followed up by asking if anything was wrong. The man replied that he wasn't sure, but they had been locked for about a week. He explained further that the guild leader had not been doing their job and was just chasing women. And since there weren't any adventurers, the road leading to the next town had been filled with monsters. Shinichi asked him if the Lord Feudal couldn't help him. Then he said no, explaining that the Feudal Lord had also been slacking on his job, or perhaps he had been manipulated by a girl named Karen, who had appeared to have influenced the guild leaders already. After telling them about Karen, he left after warning them to be careful. As they walked and chatted, they saw a group cheering for Karen. They realized the gathering was what the man told them about and discovered it wasn't normal. Erna told them that it was the work of succubus, and then Shinichi asked her if she knew something. She explained to him that before she met him, she was the luggage holder for the party known as the Night Rats. She explained that they had adventures together and headed for the 21st floor of the Mojito Labyrinth, and Karen was at the party. She explained further that Karen made the six men in their party argue and kill each other. She explained that she hid and barely escaped, but she saw her true form, which was a monster, a succubus. She explained to Shinichi further that Karen's true objective was to take control of Marna and exterminate all the adventurers. After all, adventurers were natural enemies to monsters. Just then, the gathered groups called Erna and then ordered to kill her for the sake of Karen-sama. Shinichi wondered if they were being manipulated, 
and then Marna hid behind Shinichi, asking him what they should do. Shinichi asked himself what the groups could do in the dark shadows of Marna. They fought against the group and were able to defeat them. After getting beaten, a man returned to his senses asking how he had gotten here. He said his name was Novin, and Shinichi asked him if he did not remember attacking them. Novin yelled out that his head was spinning and then asked Shinichi for help, explaining that they controlled them. Shinichi saw that Novin was still being mind-controlled, and then Erna told Shinichi that others were getting up. The guards approached them and asked them what was going on. Shinichi found out that several guards were also being controlled, and it wasn't a situation they could solve with numbers. He told Erna that it was possible that Karen was watching them from afar and then asked her to get away from them if she could. Erna replied that the guild in the city would be in shambles at that rate. Shinichi replied that they were still unaware of Karen's location and explained that they still had their cow and luggage, so they should find a place for now. Shinichi found the entire situation troubling. They returned to their hiding place, and Shinichi informed Erna that it appeared that Karen and her party did not want to anticipate her survival and that they would most likely try to kill her violently. He told her that killing the dragon had gotten her too much attention, and she told him not to make it appear as if it was her fault. She asked him what they should do from there as she cooked together with Pero. They had curry for dinner, and when they finished eating, Shinichi asked Erna if she would evolve, explaining that he had just asked the question. Erna didn't believe him, but finally agreed to evolve. They all continued the discussion, and Pero asked Shinichi if Erna could evolve when he could do the same. Shinichi assured him that he would be able to evolve in no time. And then Pero was determined to hurry and become a good kid just like Erna. Erna then told Shinichi that they should beat Karen and save the city, and his response to her was to ask if they knew where Karen was. Shinichi Tanaka was seen telling his subordinates that nothing seemed out of the ordinary and that it was quiet for the time being. The elf girl, Elena, wondered if everyone was on alert. Shinichi replied that since the guild was closed, they would just have to keep asking around. Freya was shouting at her captain, saying that she saw the little bastard go into the dungeon. She said she was telling the captain what she knew, and if he did not believe her, he would have to ask someone else. The captain held his head as if it had been hurt by Freya's loud voice. He said it was going to be tough with just the two of them. Then Shinichi approached them and asked if the captain was still looking for someone. The captain said that Shinichi was the guy from before and that he never introduced himself. He said he was Gale, the commander of the Duchess Medill's Kingsguard. Shinichi said he was Shinichi Tanaka, the leader of a party called Homeless. Gale recognized the name Homeless and asked if they were the adventurers who claimed to have defeated the Factus Dragon. Shinichi confirmed it and Gale said he needed a favor from him. He said it was a job that he could not tell anyone about. Shinichi told Gale to speak and he would listen first and then decide if he wanted to do it. Gale gathered his courage and stretched out his hand. He said they were currently searching for the Duke of Medill's son, Sir Novin Medill. He wondered if Shinichi could help with that. Shinichi asked if the person that Gale was talking about the other day was kidnapped. Gale said he was embarrassed to say that Master Novin had a penchant for adventure, and he left home on his own. He said they had orders from the Lord to bring him back as soon as possible. Gale said that, according to the information he had just received, Someone who looked like Novin Sama was seen accompanied by a high-level adventurer to the 30th level of the Great Labyrinth of Mojado. He said that if the information was true, they would need to find him as soon as possible. Gale also said that he heard that the homeless people were frequent visitors to the Great Labyrinth of Mojado, and that they were also the group who killed the Factus Dragon. He said they could really use their help to find and protect Master Novin. Shinichi asked what Novin looked like. Gale said Novin was 17, thin, and had hair parted down the middle. Elena asked Shinichi if the guy Gale just described was by any chance the guy they saw yesterday. Shinichi said yes, and Freya was shocked. She asked if they had already seen Novin. Shinichi said that coincidentally, that was true. He said that it seemed that protection would not be enough to solve the problem. Freya asked what he meant by problem. Shinichi said that currently, Novin was under the control of a succubus. Freya was confused and asked what he meant. Gale offered to explain better. He said there was a succubus who called herself Karen, and she had the ability to charm people. Shinichi said that was true, and that he was afraid they would not be able to break the spell without defeating her first. Gale said all right, and that he would see what he could do about the succubus. But he said their first priority was to protect Lord Novin. He said they could not afford to lose the man who would eventually support the nation. Shinichi asked Elena what she thought about the 30th level. She replied that she was sure they could get there now, and that she felt confident they would find Karen there too. 
Shinichi then turned to Gale and said that since they were heading in that direction, they might as well help them. Gale agreed and said that he would take him up on the offer. As they were about to leave for the mission, Freya shouted and told them to hold on. She said that she was not going to trust those people, let alone allow them to help. Gale tried to reason with her and said that they knew a lot about the labyrinth and that besides, they could use some help. Freya shouted back as she held her spear in her hand and asked what Gale was talking about. She said that unless Shinichi was hired as a luggage carrier, Gale would be humiliated by relying on the strength of an inferior adventurer. Shinichi replied to her with his eyes closed and said that Freya couldn't be serious. He suggested a duel and said that if Freya won, he would back down. And if he won, Freya would have to follow his instructions in the labyrinth. Freya replied with a mocking smile and asked if Shinichi really thought that he could defeat her. She said that it was quite humorous and accepted his challenge. Gale was the referee for the match and gave both of them a wooden sword. He said that the match would end only when an opponent was forced to concede defeat or rendered incapacitated. He also said that since the match was technical and physical, there would not be any skill or magic allowed. He asked if they both agreed to that, and they both said yes. Shinichi asked if they shouldn't be using spears instead. Freya replied that it didn't matter what weapon they used. She couldn't lose to a mere adventurer. Gale said that they could begin, and Freya charged towards Shinichi at full speed, ready to unleash a powerful strike. Freya attacked with her powerful strike, but Shinichi stopped the attack easily with his hand. This made her mad that he was blocking her powerful attack so easily with one hand with no intention of attacking her. Elena and Pero wished Shinichi good luck as the match intensified, and Gale marveled at Shinichi's power, being able to take all of Freya's attacks with one hand. He wondered if Shinichi was using only half of his total strength. As they fought, Shinichi said to Freya that in terms of pure skill, she was better than him. Freya agreed, saying that a commoner was no match for her. This made Shinichi dodge her next several attacks so easily that Freya shouted at him, saying that he shouldn't just dodge, but should fight like a man. Shinichi replied, saying that she was right and that he was getting bored too. His next few strikes rendered her wooden sword useless by slashing it into two. This was shocking for Freya as she shouted, My sword! Gale declared the match over and pronounced Shinichi Tanaka the winner. Shinichi reminded Freya that she had to keep her word, which she replied to, saying that a knight never went back on their word. She muttered to herself, saying that why did they even need help from this guy? Gale said in his head that he was surprised because after him, Freya was the most skilled fighter in the Knight's Guard. Gale looked at Shinichi and told him that he would be counting on him. He replied, no problem. Gale said that he would be meeting Shinichi and his team at the entrance of the labyrinth later, because they had to go and prepare. Shinichi said, all right. After they left, Shinichi and his team walked around the town and noticed that fewer people were around, making it look like a ghost town. Elena said that more and more people were going missing and that everyone left in the village was on their guard. Pero commented that all the stores were closed. Elena said that she couldn't believe what was happening to an entire city. She asked Shinichi if they really had what it took to beat the enemy. Shinichi told her not to worry, saying that he was invincible and that if he beat Karen, the homeless would be more famous. Elena teased him, saying that he was so full of himself. Pero agreed with him, saying that he would do his best too. He threw his hands up, just like Shinichi did, in happiness. In the scene, the two teams of Shinichi and Gale were seen gathered at the entrance of the labyrinth. Shinichi addressed them, saying that since they were all here, all that was left was to determine each person's role in the labyrinth. He started saying that Pero and Freya would be in charge of the vanguard, and that Gale would be in charge of the rear guard. Elena would be in charge of magical support in the center. He also added that from the 22nd floor and beyond, it was unknown territory. They didn't know what kind of enemies they would encounter. He told them to switch roles at any moment. As they started moving, Gale called Shinichi's attention, asking where he was going. He said that it was not the entrance to the dungeon. Shinichi replied, saying that they should just please follow him. Then they finally arrived at something that looked like a tombstone. Gale asked what this place was. Shinichi replied, saying that it was the Temple of Transfiguration and that they were going to jump to level 21 at once from there. This was shocking to Gale and his team members that such a thing was possible. They were transported to another place, which Shinichi said to them was inside the labyrinth, the 21st floor. Gale replied that he was at a loss for words, asking if Shinichi and his guys always came here like this. Shinichi replied that it was more like they were coming back home since they lived here. Gale was shocked and said that he had met a lot of people in his life, but never thought that some of them would end up living in a dungeon. 
He said that Shinichi was the leader of the homeless for a reason. Elena was annoyed and asked if that was supposed to be a compliment. Gail changed the topic and said that the transference had saved them a great deal of time, so they should begin searching for Lord Novin. As they walked inside the dungeon, they saw some burnt sticks that looked like the remains of a bonfire, the evidence of someone passing through there. Pero knelt down to smell it and said that it smelled like six people, two women and four men. Gale complimented Pero and said that he had an amazing sense of smell to be able to tell the sex of someone just by smelling them. He then changed his expression to a serious one and said that they were told that there were five high-level adventurers and one more, Master Novin. He said that they were right on the money and that they should hurry. Shinichi agreed with him. They had reached the 22nd floor, where bamboo sticks covered the place. Shinichi felt like he was back in Japan. Pero asked him if he could eat a bamboo stick. Shinichi said he could, as long as it was not too green, and told him which tree he could eat from. As they moved on, they came across a horned rabbit. Freya was enchanted by the creature and knelt down to pet it. Gail apologized to the rest of the team, saying that she was a big animal lover and sometimes lost control. Freya argued that Gail should not say anything they did not already know, and that a knight needed to be compassionate. Gail countered that compassion should not turn into obsession with a beast she could not tame. Shinichi reached out his hand to touch the animal and succeeded in making it his familiar. Freya was happy and shocked that Shinichi could also tame beasts. Shinichi said the horned rabbit was not very useful and that it was better to let it go. He gave it an instruction to go back, which Freya did not like. At the same time, Pero picked up a skeleton arm and asked if he could eat it. Shinichi shouted no as the skeleton bones began to assemble and move towards them to attack. Elena was about to use magic to fight them, but Shinichi told her to wait. He said he wanted to try something. He stretched his hand towards the skeletons and said they should become his familiars. It took some time, but it eventually worked. They became homeless skeletons, a new race of skeletons that were born when Shinichi Tanaka's magic was given to them. They were 10 times more capable than normal skeletons. Gale was shocked and asked Tanaka to explain what was happening. Shinichi said he did not mean to hide it, but he had a skill that allowed him to turn monsters into allies. Gale said he never expected Shinichi to have such a skill and that it surprised him. Freya agreed and said it was an enviable skill. Shinichi had another eye on his forehead that he used for appraisal. The eye identified one of the skeletons as a golden skeleton with light and dark features. Shinichi talked to the golden skeleton, which said it was nice to meet Mr. Tanaka. Shinichi said that from now on, it would be his monster. The golden skeleton agreed and said it was the leader of the skeletons. Shinichi said it needed a name, so he gave it the name Skeleto. Gale asked if he was taking the skeletons with him. Shinichi said yes, that they would be a great asset. At that moment, another set of big monsters appeared. The skeletons surrounded them and beat them to death. The team members commented that they were strong, but their rattling bones were so noisy. Pero found stairs that led to the 23rd floor, and they entered. Shinichi commented that first, it was a bamboo forest, and now it was a swamp. He said it was hard to believe they were really in a labyrinth. As they entered the 23rd floor, they saw insects flying all around in the air. They commented that the insects were big, and Shinichi used his appraisal skill to identify them. The appraisal result showed that the insects were mojito dragonflies, large dragonflies that could only be found in the great labyrinth of Mojito. Their transparent wings were sold at a high price as luxury food with a rarity of D. He wondered in his mind if his appraisal skill was becoming more accurate, and he realized that a D rarity was not that rare. The dragonflies started to approach them to attack, and Elena stretched her staff to use multiple fireballs to burn them to crisp. Gale was amazed and said that not even a mage in the royal court could conjure a spell as powerful as what Elena just did. He asked who the elf was, and then Shinichi's skill popped up, saying, Skill pick up. It told Shinichi to please select the skills that he wanted to learn. There were clairvoyance and flight skills, although both of them were at intermediate level. He chose the flight skill and tested it out. Four wings appeared on his back like that of a dragonfly, and he flew a bit, saying that he could finally fly in the sky. He then came down and deactivated the wings, saying that he could activate the skill anytime he wanted. He floated for some time using his skill, which made Pero shout that it looked so fun. Then, a frog monster tried to attack Shinichi using its long tongue, but Shinichi's intuition was very sharp. He grabbed the frog's tongue before it could attack him, and smiled as he said that the monster thought it could attack him with a sneak attack easily while he was distracted. 
He then pulled on the monster's tongue to drag it out of the swamp, before landing a final blow on it to kill it. Using appraisal on it, he saw that the monster was a mojito frog, a large frog that could only be found in the great labyrinth of Mojito. It was popular as a delicacy in some circles, with a rarity of D. The screen popped up with an instruction of skill pickup, asking Shinichi to please pick up a skill of underwater adaptation, although it was at intermediate level. He chose to pick up the skill, saying that it would come in handy. He smiled as he said in his mind that he had gotten another skill and that he was terrified of how powerful he was becoming. Elena could hear how he murmured to himself, and she grabbed him by the shoulders, saying that it was not important. She said that they should get out of the place already, and she tried to push him forward. But he declined, saying that first they needed to dismantle the frog, because he had heard that it was a delicacy. Elena shouted that she did not want to eat the frog meat, and Shinichi replied that if she did not like it, then she did not have to eat it. As they talked, they saw something big in front of them, and they wondered if it was perhaps a rock, because it was really huge. And Pero remarked that the big rock smelled like a frog. Shinichi warned them not to move. The rock was really huge, and they all ran away in fear. After running for a while, they stopped to catch their breath and saw that the big frog was blocking the road. What's the deal with this giant bullfrog? They wondered. Shinichi asked Elena if she could use magic to make the frog leave. But Elena said it was not that easy. If I use magic and it gets out of control, the bridge might collapse. And if we fall into the swamp, we'll be prey for other monsters, she explained. Shinichi said they couldn't go on like this. We don't have to take it down. We just have to make it retreat, he suggested. Freya agreed and said she wanted to be part of it. She held her spear with a straight face. Shinichi came up with a plan. First, Elena attacks with magic. Then, we'll create a diversion with Freya and Pero. And when it's distracted, I'll breach through the gap and kill it, he said. They all nodded and said they got it. They returned to the bridge to face the big frog, but this time, they had a plan. They all attacked according to the plan, but Freya deviated from it and tried to land a decisive blow on the big frog. However, the frog was faster and almost swallowed her until Pero came to her rescue and pushed her away. Pero ended up as the prey of the giant frog, which captured him with its tongue and was ready to swallow him. Shinichi was furious and activated his third eye in the center of his forehead. He unleashed a powerful attack using ice breath magic and slashed the frog with his sword, cutting it in half before it could swallow Pero. Pero flew out of the frog's mouth and Shinichi rushed to his side, asking if he was okay. Pero replied that it was sticky and disgusting. Shinichi then turned to Freya angrily and asked why she had attacked so recklessly, saying that it was not part of the plan and asking if she was trying to show off. He said that her complacency had almost cost his companion's life. Freya was speechless and stammered, trying to apologize. Gail intervened and said that Mr. Tanaka should calm down. He touched Shinichi's shoulder and said that he would make a full apology for what had happened when they got back to the top, but for now, they should just let it go. Shinichi was still clearly angry, but he gave instructions to the Skeletor to get rid of the corpse of the big frog from the bridge. The Skeletor replied, Yes, sir. Elena said that they needed to get out of the place because there were likely to be more giant frogs in the swamp. Shinichi agreed, saying that he did not want to fight that thing over and over again. Then Shinichi's screen popped up, which surprised him. It reported that he had met the prerequisite requirements and that his skills would be integrated and evolved. His arms and leg strength were enhanced and his body was improved. His skill evolved from swordsmanship to sword king technique, his jujitsu to kano, his danger perception to danger prediction and his hardening skill to slash resistance. He told Elena that it looked like her skill had evolved too. She asked if it happened a lot. Shinichi replied that it depended on the skill, saying that some evolved naturally with proficiency and that it was not uncommon for untalented people to remain in their early skill level stages even after 30 years. Skeletor interrupted him, saying that they had found a stair. They descended to the 24th level, and as they entered, Elena was amazed by the clean air and the beautiful scenery. She said that if she ever built a vacation home, this would definitely be the place. She said that she could finally wash herself because she had been feeling gross and uncomfortable. Shinichi used his magic to check the area and found out that there were no signs of any enemies in the vicinity. He said that they would set up the camp here and asked if anyone objected. Pero came forth smiling, holding a big crayfish. He asked Shinichi to look, saying that there were a lot of fish. 
Shinichi replied that they should make a net and go get some more for dinner. They made the net, and Elena volunteered to prepare the food. Gail offered to go gather some dry branches for the fire, and Shinichi said he was counting on him. They told Pero to join them in catching some fish. Shinichi took off his shirt and he and Pero dived into the river. As he swam, he thought to himself that thanks to his underwater adaptive skills, he could move around easily and it was not uncomfortable at all. He used his stick to spear a lot of fish and they brought back their big haul. Elena told them to cut the fish into pieces and put them in the spherical pit. Shinichi asked if she was talking about the floating pod over there and what it was. Elena said yes and explained that she was using the floating thing because their food did not fit into the pan. Shinichi asked if it was magic and she said yes. She was using fire and water spells. She said it was handy to cook without a pan. Shinichi commented that her power of evolution was truly worthy for cooking for the homeless. The food was done and she dished it out, telling everyone it was time to eat. As they ate, Gale said he never thought he would be treated to a meal like this on duty. He also said that the meat had a light aftertaste that was wonderful. Elena agreed with him and said the meat was tasty. She said she just threw the meat in before she knew what it was. Gale said he ate frog meat from time to time, but he had not eaten one that was this good. He smiled as he said this and Freya was terrified with beads of sweat on her face. She said that the meat from the man-eating frog was this. Shinichi said that it was still delicious, and she could not argue with that. Shortly after the meal, they were all sound asleep except for Freya who was on guard that night. Shinichi was seen drinking from a cup and asked Freya if she wanted some. He said it was good stuff. She said no and that she was fine. All she wanted to do was to focus on the watch. She then said to Shinichi that she wanted to talk to him about something. This caught him by surprise and he gave her his undivided attention. Shinichi sipped his tea and asked her what she had to say. She replied with a remorseful expression, saying that she was sorry about the other time. She said that she thought she could do it on her own. Shinichi looked at her and said that if she wanted to apologize, she should do it to Pero. He said that he was just telling her what he noticed as an observer. He said that he could understand why she went out on her own, since the enemy was scary after all. She said that no, it was still a bad decision. She then knelt down on one of her legs and said that she was sorry for insulting him by calling him a mere adventurer. Shinichi said that she did not have to worry about it anymore. He said that she was still a pretty serious person. She said that it was in her nature and that she was sorry. Shinichi told her that there was no sign of hostels in the area and asked her to sit for a minute. She sat at the campfire with her legs and arms tucked in. She said that her parents were actually not aristocrats, but rather well-known adventurers, as she had been told. Shinichi said that he had no idea, since she was with Mr. Gale. She continued, saying that she was actually a commoner. She said that her parents both died when she was seven, and her grandmother died a year later from an illness. She said that she was an orphan. Shinichi asked her how a kid like her survived on her own. She said that she used to live in a slum in the capital. She said that there, garbage collected from all over the city was scattered about, and if someone looked hard enough, they could find someone's leftovers. She said that she was living off what she could get her hands on, which was pretty much garbage. Then one day, she rescued a boy of noble birth who had wandered into the slums. The boy was Master Novin. In return, the kind Master Novin gave her food, clothing, shelter, and even asked her to be knighted as his own knight. She said that he was the man who brought her out of the slums and educated her as a knight. She said that if it wasn't for him, she would still be there. She continued, saying that she still hated her parents because if they hadn't been adventurers, maybe their family would have lived happily ever after. She said that that was why she was so provocative with the adventurers. She said that she felt like she had lost not only her parents, but her friend as well. She said that she was sorry. Shinichi thought to himself, no wonder she hates adventurers. Then he said to her that she did not have to worry about it anymore. He said that they could work together to find Novin. She said that she would like to change the topic. She thanked Shinichi again and told him that one day she would repay him for all he had done for her. She then changed the topic and asked if Pero was Shinichi's son. He said no, he was not. Freya commented that no wonder the two of them did not look alike. Shinichi continued, saying that they added Pero to the group because he had no parents. But as his adoptive father, he intended to take care of him. Freya replied that she could see that Shinichi was more than he appeared to be. She then asked with a puppy face if she could touch Pero's tail. Shinichi said that it was fine as long as she didn't wake Pero up. He hoped that it was not to satisfy any weird fetishes. Freya said no. She was just curious about his fluffy tail. As she touched the tail, she blushed hard and her face turned red. She drooled a little. 
Shinichi detected a risk and shouted that enemies were coming. He asked Freya to wake the others up. Someone asked where the enemy was. He said that it was attacking from above. The enemy flew in, having an eagle head and legs with a body of a lion. They identified it as a griffin. Shinichi asked his familiar skeletons to stop the griffin. The skeletons threw three chains to bind the griffin. The chains were also shocking to Shinichi, who was their master. He wondered if they were shadow chains of dark magic. The skeletons stopped the griffin with their chains. Shinichi commented that they had done excellently well. He then proceeded to subjugate the griffin, which was successful. Pero asked if he could ride the griffin. Freya couldn't resist playing with the fluffy fur of the griffin. Gael came over and said that he couldn't believe Shinichi had got his hands on a griffin. He asked if any kind of magical beast could become part of his familiar. Shinichi said that it was a tough call to make. Gale suggested that if they could get more griffins, they could use them as transportation. Shinichi agreed, saying that it was a very good idea. He told everyone to pack their bags because they were leaving to look for more griffins. Elena wasn't so happy. She asked why they were leaving already. As they walked looking for more griffins, Elena said she was tired of walking. Shinichi said he thought they would find more griffins there, while Gale apologized and said they were the only ones who had it easy. Gale and Freya were riding on the griffins while they were walking. Shinichi told him not to worry about it since they were clients. Then they saw a wheel of a carriage that looked fresh, and they could see the whole carriage scattered and in pieces all over. They wondered who had previously visited there and transported themselves with the horse-drawn carriage. Then Shinichi used a skill called Spinarule to pull the shattered parts of the carriage together with threads that came from his fingers. Shortly after, the carriage was whole, which Shinichi named Skeleton Carriage. It looked weird, and Elena shouted that she didn't want to ride on it. Pero looked at it, and his eyes glowed, saying that the carriage looked fun. Elena's face was in terror of the carriage, and a bead of sweat ran down her face. Shinichi and Pero entered, and Shinichi had to drag Elena inside, saying, Just get in. Then he told the skeleton that had been positioned to draw the cart to move. Elena screamed that she was going to die, and that the cart was going to kill her. She said that her hips hurt. Then, after some time, they came to a stairwell to the lower levels, and they descended into the 25th floor. Shinichi was so happy seeing rice fields, saying it was just what he wanted. He said, finally, I can eat rice. Elena wondered what made him so happy, and Freya replied that a mere plant turned Shinichi into such a child. Shinichi was jumping up at the sight of the rice plants. Hiro also agreed that he didn't get what was wrong with Shinichi. Gale told the three that they should not be absurd, saying the plant could be hallucinogenic. Shinichi thought in his mind that it was a terrible thing to say and wondered if these otherworldly people did not know what rice was. Then Shinichi called out to them, saying that they should come over and see something. Then they came to a tomb, similar to the one they used to transport themselves at the entrance of the dungeon. Shinichi said this place must also be the Temple of Transference, no doubt. They registered there, and Shinichi told Elena that they could come back to the 25th floor anytime they wanted. She asked what rice was that he was talking about earlier. Gale cut in from behind, asking if Shinichi was saying there was a connection between here and the entrance. He replied that yes, most likely there was. He said that now they had a clear path home. They then resumed their search, and the skeleton kept pushing the cart while Gale and Freya kept riding the griffins. Inside the cart, Elena asked Shinichi if he thought they would catch up to Novin. He replied that they were taking the shortest path and so it should be any time soon. Then the skeleton called out to him, saying, Mr. Tanaka, the stairs are up ahead. Then they descended into the 26th level, and the scenery felt normal again, like that of a dungeon. Gale volunteered that he would take the front from here on, saying that he wouldn't feel right being in the back as a knight commander. Shinichi said okay, but he had to act quickly because it looked like they had a welcoming party. Gale said that the zombies approaching were such a pain, unless their heads were destroyed, they would keep coming. Elena was hiding behind Gale, saying that they looked gross. Gale told her to stop using her as a shield. Shinichi rushed forward, saying that they should get out of the way as he struck the zombies, but their number was too much and he realized that they would be hard to deal with. So he summoned the skeletons to deal with the zombies and the skeletons defeated them. On their way, they were met by a large number of undead, also known as skeletons. The people panicked, asking Shinichi what they were going to do. He replied, saying that they should relax because each of the undead was weak, and that meant he could easily take them under his command. So he used his subjugation skill on the large number of deer and the large number of undead. 
together with the undead he had subjugated earlier. They all joined together and lifted him using the cart, raising him up as their king. Pero shouted, saying that Shinichi was awesome and that he looked like a badass. Elena asked what the fun was and what Shinichi was doing with the undead. Gail added that Shinichi had forgotten what they came to do. Freya wanted to add that the skeletons were kind of cute, but Shinichi cut her off, shouting as he gave commands to the skeletons to move on. He told the rest of them that they should keep going with the skeletons in front. As the undead skeletons marched forward, he ordered them to kick all the zombies to the curb and move on and advance. They defeated all the zombies and reached the 27th level. As they entered, Shinichi commented that it was an awfully dark level, and Elena produced a dim light in her hand. Looking around, they saw that it was a very vast place. Pero sniffed around and said that he could smell six humans and one other. They heard a scream and followed it. They saw a lady with two dark wings on her back, who was Karen, holding a man by his neck with one hand. She said to them that they had done a good job for coming all the way here. Elena said that she was the culprit who had caused all the chaos in the town of Marna. Karen replied that she was waiting for them on the 30th level, but she couldn't wait any longer. And so she came here, dropping the guy in her hand. She said that they had followed the bait well that had lured them in. Freya's emotion was high seeing Novin lying unconscious on the ground. Shinichi turned to her and told her to calm down. He said that they would buy her some time for now and told her to rescue the guys who lay on the ground unconscious when she saw a chance. Shinichi called out to Elena and Pero that they should fight. Karen asked them if three to one against a frail girl like her was fair. Shinichi told Pero and Elena not to listen to her and attack. Elena used flame magic to attack her, but Karen vanished and suddenly appeared behind Elena, saying she was right there. Shinichi rushed to her side to rescue her, but before he got there, Karen had vanished again, saying to them if they were surprised. She said that succubi, thanks to their racial trait, could teleport. Pero replied to her that all they had to do was not to give her the chance to teleport. Pero charged towards Karen, asking Shinichi to watch his back. Shinichi, Gale, and Pero all tried to hit Karen, but she easily dodged their attacks and stopped Shinichi's sword strike easily with her finger. Shinichi used the opportunity to give Karen a powerful kick that knocked her into the wall. Before she could recover from that, Elena dropped a large boulder on her to bury her, saying that there was nothing the current her couldn't handle. Shinichi asked if they really got her and said that it was easier than he thought. He called out to Gale, asking how the six people were doing. Gale replied that five of them were unconscious, and Novin seemed to be doing okay. Shinichi handed over a mushroom to Gale, saying that he should feed them when they woke up. He said that it was a cure mushroom. Gale said thanks, and Shinichi replied that Gale could show thanks by the reward. Elena said that she was going to take a nice long bath when she got home. She looked at the multitude of skeletons and asked Shinichi what he was planning to do with them. He replied that he was going home with them to tend to their fields. Elena said that, for that he didn't need that many skeletons. They were interrupted by the crack of rocks and heard a voice saying that it didn't want to change into this appearance. It was Karen as she floated in the air after she had broken the big boulder that buried her earlier into tiny pebbles. She said that they had just ruined her cute vibes. This time she was in her underwear, having a black long tail and two long horns on her head, which were not present earlier. Her pressure was so much that the people in the room could feel the power of her aura. Shinichi was puzzled by her endurance and used appraisal on her. The result showed that Karen was a vampire succubus, a hybrid of a vampire and a succubus. He told the others that Karen had vampire blood in her veins, and Elena added that vampires were calamity-class monsters. Karen smiled with her fangs and said that as a reward for pushing her so hard, she would suck their blood while they were still alive. She then used magic to summon her genus servants, who were humans in large numbers. Elena recognized them as the residents of Marna who had been kidnapped. Karen laughed maniacally and ordered her servants to kill them all. She said that they should slaughter each other like the unsightly creatures humans were. Karen laughed with an evil expression, shouting that the bloodbath should begin. Elena was scared and confused about what to do about Karen's genus servants, who were human beings that were still alive. She asked Shinichi what they should do, saying that there were hundreds of people. Shinichi told her not to panic. He then turned to his skeletons and told them to advance. He also told Gale to evacuate with the six others, lest they get caught in the middle of all this. Gale said that he understood, while Freya said that she wanted to apologize for being selfish and begged to let her stay and fight as well. Gale told her that there was a big difference between them and Shinichi and his team in terms of latent potential. Freya replied that she knew that, 
and that one wrong turn could cost her life. Even so, she wanted to fight as a duke's knight. Gale said to her that it seemed that she had made her resolution, and he would say nothing more as he carried the six people away. Freya called out to Tanaka, addressing him as Tanaka Dono, saying that although she might not be much of help, she would lend him a hand. Shinichi said that it was okay. Karen told her genus human servants to go now and demonstrate their loyalty to her by killing her enemies. Shinichi told his skeletons to buy as much time as they could and to remember that they were absolutely not to kill the humans. The human servants and the skeleton servants clashed and the skeletons were stronger. They were overpowering the human servants and knocking them out easily. Shinichi mocked Karen, saying that it seemed that his familiars were stronger than her genus. Karen mocked back, putting her hand on her eyelid, saying that she was so shocked that she was going to cry. Then she said, just kidding, as she teleported to attack Shinichi, saying that humans were expendable, and once she took control of Marna's town, she could replenish them as many times as she wanted. She continued as she blocked Shinichi's sword attack with her finger, saying that she would be more happy to make Shinichi her special genus. He replied that he refused, saying that he had no intention of becoming a subordinate to a monster. She was overpowering Shinichi when Pero charged into his aid. It made Karen mad, saying that Pero was getting in her way. She gave him a powerful kick that sent him flying in the air. Freya was angry at this, shouting, How dare you! as she charged towards Karen to attack her with her axe. Karen said that she was annoying and used flame magic directed at her, but Shinichi was fast enough to nullify the attack, which made Karen smile, saying that playtime was over. Shinichi was also fast enough to use his spinner thread to bind Karen, which made Freya rush in to finish her off. But Karen broke free easily and then attacked Freya and also slashed Elena with her finger, saying that she would suck their blood later. As Karen floated, she said that there was just one left, and that in addition to the fact that Shinichi could nullify magic, he could use various skills as well. That was why she would make him into her favorite. She stretched her two palms on Shinichi to use enslavement magic on him, a skill called genus transformation. He could feel the pressure of Karen's magic overpowering him. Karen kept using the genus transformation on Shinichi, saying that he belonged to her now and telling him to accept it. Shinichi felt a dark and sinister force flooding into him, but he told Karen not to underestimate the mental strength he had built over the last 56 years. He clenched his fists, trying to fight the mental stress that the magic was putting on his mind. Karen said that this was the first time she had seen anyone resist it so strongly, asking if Shinichi really hated becoming her genus that much. Shinichi replied that it went without saying that he only lived for himself, saying that was what made him Tanaka Shinichi, who became homeless. He then used familiar transformation, making his third eye on his head open as he mustered all his muscles. He shouted as he used this spell of transformation and shattered Karen's genus transformation on him, which shocked Karen. She saw that the man had cast familiar transformation on himself, and her face was full of terror. She flew back a little, and Shinichi smiled with beads of sweat covering his face. His third eye open, he said that he had countered it, saying that Karen should not think that he would just sit back and let her do anything. Karen got angry saying that she couldn't believe that she would have to expend so much power on one puny human. Perot swept in with great speed, saying that Shinichi should look after Freya and Elena and then attack Karen. He said that he would never forgive her for hurting all of them. Karen replied that she hated children very much, but she felt extra repulsed by this brat, referring to Pero. Shinichi picked up the two girls, Freya and Elena, and they regained consciousness. They looked for their wounds and saw that they were completely healed. Shinichi said that it was the effect of Cure Mushroom. The girls asked about Karen, and Shinichi said that the fight was still going on, and that Pero was buying them some time, but it wouldn't last long. Freya said with a frustrated face that if only she had more power, while Elena asked Shinichi if there was anything she and Freya could do. Shinichi looked at them with a serious face, saying that they would raise their abilities and defeat that woman, referring to Karen. He said that they should try Acupuncture Push to increase their abilities. Elena asked if it was the painful technique, and Freya asked her if it was really painful. Shinichi pulled up his screen, and after checking for some time, he said that it was strange. He said that he couldn't find acupuncture push anywhere on his screen. After looking for some time, he came across the vitality skill and said that there it was, saying that it had evolved. He then turned to the two girls, asking them to bend over now. They protested, saying no, and Shinichi shouted that they should hurry up because they didn't have much time. He then used the vitality skill on the two girls and the two girls were shocked that it didn't hurt. They said to themselves that it was amazing, 
saying that they could feel the power overflowing within them. Shinichi said that it seemed that the vitality skill didn't have the same drawback as the acupuncture push. Elena said that with what they had just done, they might be able to win. Shinichi told her to wait and study, saying that she should not rush in blindly. He continued telling the girls that the opponent would aim for their backs using her teleportation skill, saying that the two girls had to watch each other's backs and remember to stay close to each other as they attacked. The girls said they had got it, and they rushed back to where the fighting was taking place. Elena used wind cutter magic directed at Karen, who was shocked to see Elena alive. How is it possible? Karen asked. Too bad for you, Karen. The future great mage will not be defeated easily, Elena replied. Then Freya attacked from Karen's blind spot, hitting her with a powerful strike of her axe. Karen tried to counter with her magic, but she was stunned to see Freya dodge her attack easily. Elena countered Karen's attack with a flame wall, which amazed Karen. She was confused about how Elena had suddenly gotten so powerful compared to the last time they faced off. Elena mocked Karen, saying that the magic that Karen was so proud of was nothing in front of her. Karen was still in shock, and a bead of sweat ran down her cheek. Then Pero charged in from behind Karen, saying that she should not get carried away. He slashed Karen's back with his claw weapon, making her scream out in pain. She thought to herself that she should retreat for now, but before she could, a powerful slash landed on her back. She looked to see who it was, and it turned out to be Shinichi. Where did you come from? She asked. It was all thanks to the stealth skill. You were so distracted by my companion's attacks that you did not notice me, Shinichi replied. Karen was now bleeding from her mouth and very angry. She was completely surrounded by Shinichi, Elena, Freya, and Pero. Shinichi said to her, The tables have turned. Accept your fate because your two wings that you used to levitate have been cut down and your back badly slashed. Karen was dripping with blood, completely helpless in their middle. They all stretched their weapons towards Karen, ready to finish her off.